Hello everyone. Uh, today I am very excited to uh, record this uh, interesting uh, paper, which will be the next uh, session in our researcher bootcamp. I am also partially excited because, as you can see, my recording equipment has received an upgrade. Uh, so today we'll be looking at um, this technique, which is called as uh, variational autoencoders, uh, and these are often called as VAEs as well. Uh, variational autoencoders are uh, have become uh, very popular, and uh, they are one of the uh, more used algorithms. Uh, for generative models, generative AI models. Now, this was the paper which actually came out with respect to uh, variation autoencoders and it was released in the year of uh, 2013. Uh, it is titled Autoencoding Variational Base. And within three years, this paper became extremely popular and uh, it garnered wide attention. Now, I have tried reading this paper and uh, I feel that this paper is mathematically uh, more complicated. Uh, and then it, it, it becomes a bit challenging to understand this paper. For me also, it it took quite some time to understand this concept of variation autoencoders and uh, i went through many tutorials uh, i uh, thought about this a lot and uh, uh, for this session i uh, i thought that instead of going through this original paper we should uh, go through this paper which is also a, a tutorial on variation autoencoders this also has around 2,000-2,500 citations. It is an uh, excellently written paper. And uh, this actually uh, talks about variation autoencoders in a, uh, in a very step-by-step -step procedure. So we are going to go through this, uh, uh, this topic by referring to this particular paper. So let us get started. Uh, Let's start with the abstract. So the abstract says that in just three years, uh, variation autoencoders have emerged as one of the most popular approaches to unsupervised learning of complicated distributions. Uh, more specifically, VAEs are appealing because uh, they are built on top of standard function approximators and uh, can be trained with stochastic gradient descent. They have already shown a lot of promise in generating uh, complicated data, including hand-written digits, faces, house numbers, CFR images, segmentation, etc. So, uh, as I said, the paper was released in 2013 and by 2016, they were applied to a range of different applications and uh, they, they were uh, they had turned out to be uh, quite good. So, so let's let's look at uh, uh, this particular uh, problem in detail. So, we are now uh, we have entered the field of generative modeling. We also saw an example of uh, generative adversarial networks in this case. VAs, I, I believe, came before that. So, generative modeling is a broad area of machine learning which deals with uh, models of distributions P of X defined over data points X in some potentially high dimensional space. For instance, images are a popular kind of data which might uh, create generative models. Each data point has thousands of millions of pixels and the generative model's job is to somehow capture the dependencies between these pixels. Exactly what it means to capture these uh, dependencies depends on what exactly we want to do with our model. So, uh, okay. So, uh, one cares about producing more examples that are like those which are already there in the database. 
so uh, essentially what what they are trying to say is that let me uh, show this with the help of a diagram so uh, here uh, what x represents Okay, uh, so uh, let me first quickly erase this or we'll just go down. Okay, so what we are trying to do is here is that let's say this is the data which is known to us, which we are calling as X, uh, right? And uh, this is the observed data. Uh, our task now is that we want to generate generate data which is similar to x uh, so this is the problem that uh, we are looking to tackle in this particular project now, uh, as an example, you might say that, let's say you have been given 10 uh, images of cats, let's say, for example. And uh, when you pass this through the algorithm, you might ask it to generate um, 11th image so uh, how would be uh, how would uh, this be done we have been given 10 images and we would like to generate an 11th image uh, so here is where we introduce the concept of probability essentially we would like to learn a distribution which would capture the series of images let's let's take a uh, let's take a simple example right uh, let's say uh, we have a class of 50 students and uh, these 50 students have let's say got certain bunch of marks and uh, someone asks you the question that uh, okay so there is a new student entering the class can you Tell me what is the range of marks that this person or this student is going to get after the exam. Typically, how would this be done is that if let's say we had a distribution of the marks. right? So let's say let's say we had a distribution where out of 100, let's say maximum people have got 45, then few have got around 85, few have got let's say around 10 or 15. Uh, so when someone asks you what is the marks that uh, the new student is going to get, you will say that with maximum probability I can say that it will be 45. But it can be a deviation around the standard deviation as well. But this 45 number is crucial to you. Now because you have represented the marks as a form of this distribution, it actually allows you to uh, uh, represent it in a in a uh, in a proper way. That's why representing data by distributions allows us to generate a new data point which follows that distribution. I hope you are understanding what I am trying to say. So finally, at the end of it, uh, we are trying to we are learning a distribution which captures our 
ऑब्जर्व डेटा मोस्ट एक्यूरेटली this is the problem that we are trying to solve in essence now let's let's try to move back uh, to our pdf so uh, they say that we could start with a database of raw images and synthesize the unseen images we could take hand written text and try to produce a new hand written text for example tools like these might actually be useful for graphic designers uh so training this type of model has long uh, been a challenge in the uh, in the machine learning community and one of the most popular frameworks that uh, have dealt with this problem has been provided by uh, variation auto encoders uh, the assumptions of this model are weak and training is fast via back propagation these characteristics have contributed to the rise in popularity so this is not a formal scientific paper as as i have already mentioned but whatever we learn here uh, serves as a uh, this is like the paper is a subset of what we'll be talking about in this in this particular uh, paper so this document will help you understand the paper also in a great amount of detail so let's start with the preliminaries what is the meaning of latent variable space when training a generative model the more complicated the dependencies the more difficult is the model to train take for example that we are generating images of handwritten characters and uh, we only care about modeling the digits 0 to 9 so if the left half of the character contains the left half of 5 then the right half cannot contain the left half of 0 or the character will look very weird intuitively it helps if the model first decides which character to generate before it assigns a value to any specific pixel this kind of decision is called formally as a latent variable that is before our model even draws anything it first randomly samples a digit value z from the set 0 to 9 and then make sure that all the strokes are matching that character z is called latent because given just a character produced by the model we don't necessarily know which settings of the latent variables would generate the character so uh, let me actually try to uh, help you understand what is the meaning because it is kind of confusing so so far we looked at observed data now we are going to shift to uh, okay so now we are going to look at an observed data let's say z so what does this mean let's let's try to understand um so so i often try to understand this by the example of uh uh dimensionality reduction which is often done by principal component analysis so let's let's assume that uh, we have let's assume that sorry is for this let's assume that we have okay so uh, let's say we have x axis and y axis and uh, we have this this data that we have observed now uh, in the in the problem of dimensionality reduction what happens is that we represent this data by a direction in which there is maximum variance 
so you often ignore the contributions let's say we have these two dimensions x hat and y hat uh, so so what i'll do is that i'll first of all uh, transform my coordinate axes from x and y to x hat and y hat uh, so essentially what happens it helps you to reduce the number of dimensions because the data will say that the y component of the data is almost zero so all, all the data can be essentially represented by a perpendicular from this and then uh, the x hat component so so let's try to relate it by a uh, latent variable so here what we are doing is that we are uh, representing the original vector by another representation which is the reduced order representation of that particular vector uh, if if you have gone through auto encoders after you perform the encoding you get a reduced order vector which is often called as the code now uh, essentially you are moving from the original dimensions to a new dimensions so the latent variable z uh, is is called to be belonging to the latent space now this space will have a certain number of dimensions which are currently unknown to us but you can uh, consider this as a reduced or uh, reduced order representation of our observed data you can often uh, reduced order order representation try to relate it with this example which i have given at the top uh now uh, to give an actual physical example of this um, let's say you have uh, you have a document with let's say the document has 2000 words right and uh, let's say you have a query queue and you want someone has asked you the question that you have to match it with all the words of the document so instead of matching it directly with each and every word what you first do is that you represent this document by a reduced order version of this same document which might be a vector of 10 digits and uh, after that uh, you try to uh, and and of course this representation you would have optimized such that when you again uh, reconstruct it the reconstruction error would be minimal as possible so essentially you would represent this document by this code vector which will be a reduced order representation and you will compare that with the query uh, this is a very uh, uh, simple explanation and you might find some loopholes in comparison of this but uh, the take away message from this is that the latent space is something like a reduced order representation of the model variables so we'll be talking of two variables here uh, in this entire uh, document one is z or z and the second is x i remember that we are learning what is the distribution of this x that is our problem but we are going to start with this latent space this will be important from us uh, uh, for us we will not be starting from the original uh, dimensionalities of the problem but we will be starting with a reduced order version of the model let's move to the paper uh, back now uh, before we can say that our model is representative of our data set we need to make sure that for every data point x there is one setting of the latent variable which uh, causes the model to generate something very similar to x formally say we have a vector of latent variable z in a higher dimensional space z which we can easily sample according to some probability density function p of z defined over uh, defined over capital z then say we have a family of deterministic functions f of z comma theta uh, parameterized by a vector theta uh, where uh, f is deterministic but z is random and theta is fixed then f of z comma theta is a random variable in the space x we wish to optimize theta such that we take sample z from p of z and with high probability 
they will likely be the excess in our data set so uh, okay so let's let's try to uh, unwrap this this is again a bit involved because we are seeing a lot of different terminologies uh, okay so we'll 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 just try to uh, understand what we are essentially doing you know by by taking a simple example uh, okay so let's let's assume that uh, these are the uh, axes and let's say that this is your original data which is the observed data okay this is a simple example but i think all of the things will be demonstrated nicely with this example so this is the observed data this is the collection of observed data over here this is following some distribution which we want to learn x now what we'll be doing uh, as a part of this is that uh, we'll be starting with a uniform normal distribution z let's say with a mean u a mean of 0 and a variance of 1 uh and this distribution is is in uh, let's say it's uh, uh so so this data is three dimensional i initially mentioned is 2d but let's say it's 3d and uh, we have three axes x y and z right so this distribution of uh which is called z which is similar to this z over here right so now from this how do i go to this that is the problem that we are trying to solve uh, essentially we'll be doing two things firstly we'll be uh, taking this z and we'll be applying a transform uh, we'll be applying a transform to this Just give me a second. Uh, just getting used to how to use this properly. Okay, so we have Z, and uh, what we'll be doing is that we'll be applying a transform over here, which is called F of Z. And this transform will depend on some parameters theta. So essentially what this function is doing is that uh, this function is taking uh, these latent variables and transforming it into a three dimensional space. So imagine that you are holding the piece of paper over here. I hope you can see this. Let's say this is the piece of paper. Using the transformation, you are transforming it in space like this. And this transformation, then you are trying to align it as much as possible with the observed distribution. So heading back over to this, what we'll be doing is that we'll be taking this and then transforming over here so that this is the new plane and then our data appears something like this. So. Uh, you try to match this x as closely as possible so so there uh, there are some intricacies to this which we'll discuss but essentially f is a function which uh, uh, which takes uh, the vector z and then transforms it into a different space so let's try to read this paragraph again uh, okay so we have a family of deterministic functions f of z which depend on parameter theta and uh, we wish to optimize theta such that we can sample z from p of z and with higher probability f of z comma theta will be like the excess in our in our data set right so essentially 
we want to optimize theta such that uh, the variables z can be transformed by f of z and they look as closely as possible to our original data x. So to make this mathematically precise, we are aiming to maximize the probability of x in each training data set and it can be represented by this probability of x is equal to integral of probability of x given z into the probability of z right where f of z comma theta has been replaced by a distribution function probability of x given z which allows us to make the dependence of x on z explicit by using the law of total probability uh, okay so uh, I hope up till now all of us are on the same page with respect to essentially you have uh, an observed data x and uh, this is x you are trying to learn this and you have z which is transformed by the function f and it's going to x so in a sense probability of x given z is kind of known to us because uh, it will it will have a mean now i might be jumping here a little bit but uh, we'll we'll try to see so it will let's say be a gaussian distribution with a mean given by f and a standard deviation given by let's say epsilon i where epsilon is the noise we'll we'll try to see what this is but uh, for now just remember that uh, this this quantity is known to us because uh, if if this function uh, we can learn this function by finding the appropriate value of theta we can learn this probability as well so uh, the final problem then is if 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 you can see is trying to optimize this which is finding a probability which matches closely finding a distribution which matches as closely as possible to our observed data but this distribution can in turn be represented by this probability of x given z times probability of z okay so up till now uh, we are following what's written in the paper the intuition behind this framework called maximum likelihood is that if the model is likely to produce training set samples then uh, it is also likely to produce similar samples this is similar to the example of the the scores uh, in the exam uh, of of the students where we are trying to model the marks received by the students by a Gaussian distribution. So similarly, we are trying to learn a distribution that can match or reproduce our training data samples and as closely as possible. And we are assuming that the world is a structured place. There is not a lot of randomness in the world and the world is structured, which allows us to claim that if our distribution matches the training data set as closely as possible, if we sample from that distribution, we will get uh, new examples, new images, new data sets, new handwritten digits, which follow the same rules which are set in the images or the data set. In VA is the, the type of this is Gaussian, which I mentioned uh, it's, it's Gaussian. That is, it has mean F of Z and covariance uh, equal to identity matrix I times uh, Sigma, where Sigma is a hyperparameter. Uh, so essentially we'll okay so let's let's try to move next in general and particularly early in our training our model will not produce outputs that are identical to any particular x by having a gaussian distribution we can use gradient descent to uh, increase p of x by making f of z comma theta approach x for some z okay so this is uh, this is all we have covered okay so now let's let's come to the main part of variation autoencoders uh, the mathematical basis of variation autoencoders uh, they say has 
relatively little to do with classical auto encoders va is approximate equation 1 which is this equation the approximate this according to the model shown in figure 1 we'll try to see what they are or this model is they are called auto encoders only because the final training objective that derives from this setup does have an encoder and a decoder and resembles a traditional auto encoder unlike sparse auto encoders there are generally no tuning parameters which are analogous to sparsity penalties okay so uh, to solve equation one there are two problems that vas must deal with how to define latent variables and how to deal with the integral over z vas gives a definitive answer to both firstly how do we choose the latent variable z such that we capture the latent information returning to our digits example the latent decisions that the model needs to make uh, before it starts painting the digit are actually more complicated it needs to choose not only the digit but the angle the stroke width and there are many abstract properties ideally we want to avoid deciding by hand what information each dimension of z encodes so vas take uh, an unusual approach they assume that there is no simple interpretation of the dimensions instead they assert that samples can be drawn from a simple distribution uh, a gaussian distribution with a mean of zero and covariance matrix which is the identity matrix how is this possible so this is uh, this is quite interesting let's have a look the key is to notice that any distribution in d dimensions can be generated by uh, taking a set of d variables that are normally distributed and mapping them through a sufficiently complex function for example say we want to construct a 2d random variable whose value lies, uh, lies on a ring so uh, let's say we want to construct something like this what happens is that we construct a Gaussian first, which is a uniformly distributed variable z. And then we can apply a very complicated function g of z here, which takes it from this image on the left to the image on the right. This is exactly the strategy that VA is used to create uh, arbitrary distributions. So uh, let's, let's try to see what that means. Let's say uh, we want to generate a distribution which looks something like this it's this is a random distribution what va says is that we'll always start with a gaussian and we'll apply a sufficiently complicated function f of z with parameters theta which will take it from here to this complicated function now in the example in the paper they have given a very nice example where uh, uh, you can take it from a Gaussian and you can apply a function to take it to a ring. So, so essentially, uh, let's say there are many images that we are, we have given and we want to learn a representation of these images. VAs claim that let's say we start with a normal distribution. There will always exist a transformation that can take it from a normal distribution to the distribution of the images. So here in this, this quantity, uh, this quantity over here, this is represented by a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a covariance matrix of sigma times i, where this is again a hyperparameter which we will be learning in the process. Or you can even actually set it to one. So this is this is not actually learned. This is unity. Okay. So uh, now all it remains is to maximize equation one, where p of z is equal to the Gaussian distribution, as is common in machine learning. If we can find a computable formula for p of x, and we can make take the gradient, then we can optimize the model using stochastic gradient descent. It is uh, actually conceptually straightforward to compute P of X approximately. We first 
sample a large number of values z and compute p of x the problem here is that in higher dimensional spaces n needs to be extremely large before we can have an accurate estimate let's take an example of handwritten digits say that our digit data points are stored in a pixel space in 28 by 28 images since p of x comma z is an isotropic gaussian the negative log probability of x is proportional squared euclidean distance from f of z and x a model which produces the image shown in 3b is probably a bad model since this digit is not like 2 so they are talking about this example this 3b here over here uh, hence we should set the sigma hyper parameter such that this kind of erroneous digit does not contribute to p of x on the other hand a model which produces 3c where uh, you can see this is again a 2 but it is shifted to the right and bottom this this figure third figure so it's a 2 but it is shifted to the right and the bottom unfortunately we can't have it both ways if you take a mean squ square error let's say as a matrix probably here the mean square error will be high because it's it's shifted but you can see it still represents a 2 right so uh, even if our model is an accurate generator of digits, we would likely need to sample thousands of digits before we need, need before we produce a two that is that is sufficiently similar to the one. Instead, VAs alter the sampling procedure to make it faster without changing the similarity metric. So let's actually summarize what we have learned so far. Okay, so we have a space of latent variable Z. From here, we are taking this and uh, we are putting it through we are taking it and uh, Uh, sorry guys, this is taking some time. Okay, so essentially what we are trying to do is that we are taking this Z and uh, we are putting it through this function f of Z which depends on parameter theta. Uh, right, and then uh, we are getting, we are transforming it into a variable uh, which is let's say called x hat and then now we want to make this x hat as close to uh, our original distribution which is marked by x as possible now the question is that uh, how how do i know what this z is right so we have said that from z we have a way to reproduce x which is okay but how do we know what this z is in the first place? That information is uh, completely unknown to us. So essentially we need to find a way to uh, go from x to z. Because we, have, we can already go from z to x, right? But how, how do I generate, uh, how do I generate z? So this is something which we have not yet solved and even though uh, we are saying that okay probability wise uh, we can sample it from this distribution uh, but we need to find a way to uh, 
for example the dimensions of this are not known what what are the what are the dimensions of z so we need to find a way to go from x to z okay so how to go from x to z in practice for most z a p of x given z will become nearly zero and hence contribute almost nothing to our estimate of p of x the key idea behind variational auto encoder is to attempt to sample values of z that are likely to have a produced x and hence compute p of x just from those this means that we need a new function q of z given x which can take a value of x and give us a distribution of z values that are likely to produce x so essentially what we are looking to find is that we are looking to find a function that is something like an inverse of uh, f of z given theta we have already looked at the function f in in some detail we are looking to find this inverse actually which will uh, take in x and give out z the problem is that f is not known to us beforehand so what we will be doing is that we will be trying to uh, learn a new function x a uh, learn a new function q we will we'll be trying to learn this function such that it matches f inverse as closely as possible that is what we will be essentially trying to do so we have introduced x z f now we are introducing a new variable called q hopefully the space of values that are under q which will, uh, will be much smaller than the space of all z's that are likely under the prior p of z this lets us for example compute expected value of z uh, over p of x given z relatively easily okay so now you can see there is a bit of uh, a bit of mathematics here which uh, explains some of the details of auto encoder uh, and how exactly the function q is optimized uh, so i'll i'll be going through the mathematics of the auto encoder also separately okay so uh, there is some sort of mathematics from page 8 and it goes right until uh, page 12 uh, after which they start to explain the applications so uh, i'll be explaining the mathematics in a separate video however for the purpose of understanding variational auto encoders uh, mathematics are are a bit important because they help you to understand uh, the term which is called as uh an estimated lower bound which is the elbow and that's where the term variation auto encoder actually comes from so i'll i'll possibly cover that uh the division of the entire objective function into the two terms and how we can uh, find the lower bound um yeah so uh, for uh, for now let us just understand uh, uh, conceptually what we are trying to do in uh, in the variation auto encoders and we'll we'll start from this q which i just uh, just described so essentially uh, what you are doing is that let's say we have uh, x right which are a bunch of values now from x uh, you are trying to learn a function that can uh, help you go from x to z which is represented by q the question is now how do i estimate q so q is also represented by a, a gaussian distribution with a mean and with a variance and uh, these are represented by these parameters are represented by neural networks which are learned as we go through the network uh so now you can see that there are two parallel tracks in the top track what is happening is that from z uh 
uh, we are applying the function f where these parameters are learned and we are adding a noise here with a mean of 0 and a unit Cauchy and then taking it to x hat and our objective is to match this x hat as much closely as possible to x all right so this is this is this is one track that uh, we are following and and you can actually visualize this track uh, very in a very interesting way so uh, what we are essentially doing is that let's say we have uh, uh, this uh, this paper which is the distribution of variables in the latent space which is let's say uh, a gaussian distribution now from here we transform it and warp it so that it goes to a three-dimensional space through the function f and then uh, this becomes a curve right which is represented by this transformation but maybe the data points are somewhere uh, outside this curve so we add a noise function to it to represent it graphically let's say this is these are our bunch of points and uh, what we are doing here is that let's say we are trying to fit a plane which so this is through f of z comma theta we have reached till this point but now you can see that there are all these perpendicular vectors from uh, the actual data to the plane so if we add the noise we can get as close as possible to the real data and that noise is represented by this function uh, this gaussian distribution which takes us uh, from after you apply this function f we add it to the noise and then we get this distribution which we we want to make it as close as possible to x so given z we can easily reach x hat we have a way to do that as we just saw you transform it uh, you transform it and you add noise that's it but then how do you get this z in the first place for that you uh, you have another parallel track which takes you from x and then uh, this is where the q function comes in with a mean and a variance which you are learning so from x you go to z so this actually represents the encoder part of the auto encoder and uh, this represents the decoder part here you are trying to learn the uh, this theta here you are trying to learn the mean and the variance and uh, you will find this explained in this diagram as well over here so from this diagram you can see that in both of these diagrams are quite similar actually from x uh, you apply this encoder q with a mean and a variance which you are trying to learn so you get z then you apply this decoder you can see that there is this function f of z which is applying and uh, you are trying to minimize this error between x and f of z and this is the noise which is applied here so all all the components that uh, we have discussed are, are are represented in this diagram which essentially is the main diagram for variation auto encoders uh, there is there is somewhat complicated mathematics over here uh, which helps you understand uh, concepts however there are some prerequisites required to understand this understanding of uh, Bayesian probability is actually important uh, to understand some of the details however the basic conceptualization remains the same what we just saw in all these all the explanation that I uh, that I mentioned beforehand if you want to, uh, me to go through the mathematics uh, just let me know we'll go through the mathematics also in detail so hopefully this introduces you to this paper uh, of variation auto encoder uh, you can first go through this basic paper uh, going through till page seven eight should be easy for you after that you can actually go through this diagram and try to understand it uh, and uh, hopefully you will understand the basics of variation auto encoder this paper introduced it however it's it's a bit uh, bit theoretical i would say we can understand this diagram though uh, where uh, whatever we learned in the in the basics is actually covered here uh, and and mentioned in the initial part so initial two three pages would be 
a readable after that it goes into a bunch of mathematics uh, okay guys so this this covers the portion on uh, variation autoencoders if you want me to cover the mathematical portions as well just let me know